on your own, but uh, we'll just take up an hour of your time and I'll try to run through uh, some things that I think will be new to some people. And I'm hoping that uh, you find it. Ah, am I still on there? I keep getting uh, different signals on the screen. Are we together? You're still on. Oh, okay. I don't see you. All right. So um, my name is Tomas Gonzalez. And I'm an artist who's been carving pumpkins since my three daughters were very little and they're all grown up now. So it's been quite a long time. And in the course of my pumpkin carving, I'd like to challenge myself to do something more interesting um, every year. Um, so I started out carving classic jack-o'-lanterns with, you know, just openings in the pumpkin. And then uh, my creative urges led me to try new things with pumpkins in order to create different visual effects. And what I like the most is the quality of the pumpkin is that you're working with light and uh, it's trying to get different effects using the light, the candle light within the pumpkin that makes it uh, very, very special for me as a medium. Um, so with that said, let's go to some of the uh, pictures that I've provided you with Angela so that we can show people what we're, we have in mind. All right, let's see if we get that on the full screen. The image that uh, you should be seeing now is uh, what I call a classic jack-o'-lantern, right? Um, it's basically, you've seen these kind of jack-o'-lanterns before. We open them up and uh, cut out the, uh, the, the eyes and the nose and the mouth. And in this case, you either get light coming through the opening or you don't get light. And what I try to do over time is to find, to get different levels of light in order to create visual effects. So we're going to actually start with a classic jack-o'-lantern today. And because it's, uh, we're all experiencing this COVID era experience, we're going to put a mask on a classic jack-o'-lantern and try to do that in a creative way. And uh, in the long run, actually, the library wants to invite everybody to take their hand at doing a, a mask on a pumpkin and we'll collect all these images that you send in and uh, put them up together as an art show. So you can be part of this whole process that we're creating. So let's take a look at um, one of the older pic ones that I did, the Lady Liberty that's coming up next. That's a picture of me back in 2001. And uh, we experienced another tragedy in our country back in 2001, of course it was 9-11. And uh, that year, the pumpkins I were carving all had a very patriotic theme about them. This is Lady Liberty. And as you can see with Lady Liberty here, on, the, on what is our right-hand side of her face, I skinned away the, uh, the rind of the pumpkin so you get that light skin tone. On the left-hand side of, of the face there, um, the skin was left on. And in the whites of the eyes and the highlights of the eyes, it's got cut all the way through. So you get a really bright light. So you can see that you get different levels of light just by whether you remove the rind or not, or whether you cut obviously all the way through. And another thing to notice about this pumpkin is, you notice I've used the, the top of the pumpkin to create the, the rays of light that come out of her crown. And so instead of just cutting a hole, we can use, you know, different elements to create different dimensions in pumpkins. So let's take a look at the next close up of Lady Liberty. There it is again, you can see the, the, white, the whites of her eyes is where it cuts all the way through and, uh, and her face is in either a dark lines on, on a lighter background or light lines on a dark background because of leaving on that rind. All right, the next one is the man in the moon. And there's just a very little modulation between the two of them. It's basically, uh, there's notice that there's no holes that go all the way through. So I don't get any of that really bright, unimpeded light, which you can see what that looks like. There's the man in the moon. Now the next pumpkin I call JQ boy, meaning it's cuboid jack-o'-lantern, Jack, cuboid Jack. Um, and this is what it looks like unlit. 
And you can see that the whole image of this pumpkin is made up of what looks like uh, cubes or blocks. On the right side of each of those cubes, the rind is left on the pumpkin. On the left side of the cube, I've just barely scraped off the rind. And on the very tops of all the cubes, I've cut down deeper and there's none of the pumpkin skin there at all. And of course, then there are holes that go all the way through. So if we look at the next picture, you'll see what it looks like when it's illuminated. And you see that great effect and it, it's wonderful. Um, photography is wonderful because it, it documents what we're, we're looking at. There's no um, substitute for seeing a pumpkin in real life because to see this pumpkin, that pattern goes all the way around the pumpkin. And as you walk around it, you notice um, you, you can, or as you walk around the pumpkin, you can see over to the edges when, when the curvature of the pumpkin uh, sort of uh, foreshortens the image, they, the uh, cubes sort of disappear. So you get this very interesting and dramatic effect uh, on that pumpkin. So uh, that's just by saying that as, as good as photographs may be, um, they don't capture the same experience of, of seeing a pumpkin live. That's one of the wonderful things I love about carving pumpkins and displaying them. Okay, next picture. There we go, dare to read. If I'm doing faces, face after face after face, I want to try to get it, make it more interesting. So one way to do that is to introduce some other element. In this case, I put in a hand so that the jack-o'-lantern can hold up a book. He's got his nose in a book. And that way I can add interesting other elements to my jack-o'-lantern. And my idea of a jack-o'-lantern is just a pumpkin, which is in its entirety a head of some character. So this was a way to introduce other things to make it more interesting. Um, if you'll notice, that book is not unlike a mask in front of a face. So uh, keep that in mind because we, want, we, we may want to, or you may want to, put uh, some sort of writing or image or logo or something on the front of the mask or some pattern, but it wouldn't be unlike uh, this pumpkin who likes to have his nose in a book. All right, and the next one, another pumpkin wearing a mask of sorts. This one's wearing a ski mask. So everything's covered up except the holes where the eyes and the mouth are. And that made for an interesting uh, effect that way. Um, next pumpkin, this is a rather old one. I don't know if you can tell it's a classic looking jack-o'-lantern, is it not? But what it's wearing is an antique catcher's mask. So you can see the heavy wire or metal uh, cage that goes around the face and between the metal cage and the face of the jack-o'-lantern was a leather that was packed with horsehair or whatever as a padding. So you've got those soft uh, uh, billowing uh, padding there. And then you've got the, the jack-o'-lantern face in the back. And what this does is it creates different horizons. You've got the wire in front of the, of the padding in front of the face and uh, especially if you look down around the lower bottom part of the mouth, you can see that you looks, it looks like you have three different levels or horizons. It's actually, of course, all on the same level. It's all on the skin of the pumpkin, but it creates the illusion that you've got these different uh, receding horizons, which create this illusion of depth, which is a wonderful thing, as well as different textures. So let's go to the next one. Now here's a pumpkin, we're looking at it from the side, which doesn't have a face at all. It's called RAF, which means the Royal Air Force. And this pumpkin was done a number of years ago in celebration of uh, the people who were uh, the pilots in the Battle of Britain. And of course, at this time in history, where the, uh, the veterans of World War II are, are disappearing. So this pumpkin doesn't have a face. This person has disappeared. Uh, one of the f people who, uh, Churchill said that so many owed so much to so few, those pilots of the RAF. And so if we look at that uh, leather fi uh, fighter pilot's helmet, you know, we've got different kinds of materials there. We've got the earplugs that seem to come out. We've got the fleece that was the, in the warm, warm jacket for the high altitude flying. 
and the leather. It's just interesting things to do with different shapes and textures and qualities for, uh, to make uh, our pumpkins interesting. And the next one is called the Black Widow and she's wearing a veil. Um, and we may see more of her later on, but uh, it was fun. It was even fun designing earrings for her. You know, we've got a spider hanging down from a thread on that dangling earring. All right. And the next one is an executioner. It used to be a very popular kind of outfit to wear at Halloween when I was a kid. You know, you wear a, a black mask. This is the guys that uh, chopped off people's heads. So this one's called Jack Ketch. And uh, it's interesting, different textures using uh, stippling kind of. We got a five o'clock shadow on his face. Of course, the mask is really black. And uh, it's an interesting thing. If you look at that nose, that nose looks like it's coming out towards you. And uh, if you make something light, uh, it looks like it's coming closer. And to make something lighter on a pumpkin, you've got to thin the wall, or if you're cutting from the outside, dig in deeper. So ironically, that little bit of light, for instance, near the tip of his nose on the left-hand side is something that's cut deeper into the pumpkin. So you cut deeper in to make it look like it's coming out. So it's kind of an interesting thing. But there we have Jack Ketch. Um, the next one, this is a blindfolded person, another person who was executed. This one's called Joe Hill. And on this, uh, compared to the other ones like The Man in the Moon, which was very graphic, very hard line, it's soft. I've just carved in and I'm just skinning away the rind at various places in order to create that soft look of the, the shape of the face, as well as the softness of the cloth that uh, is the blindfold around uh, Joe Hill. And uh, you can get fancy with this, just like J.Q. Boyd, that cube pattern ran all the way around the pumpkin. If we look at the back of uh, Joe Hill, you see that I've got him tied up there in the back there with the uh, blindfold. That little square underneath the knot down at the bottom, I plugged it so that we wouldn't have this glaring bright spot when we photographed it. But that, that little spot is a, is a trap door. I, um, let's go back to that. The, um, the reason I've got that hole there is when you put a candle in it, it's gonna go out unless it gets oxygen. And you notice that on the front of this pumpkin, there was no openings at all for air to get in or out. So you need a flue you need that little uh, porthole so that air can go in to feed the candle flame. And notice up at top, there's a light spot there. That's the chimney hole up on the top, which allows the uh, heat and gas from the candle to go out so that your candle will not, uh, your candle stays bright and functioning. All right. And the next one is this one I call gas. And uh, it's a uh, depiction of a German army officer in World War I when, of course, the horrific use of uh, poisonous gas was employed. And uh, once again, if you notice the front of that respirator, because it's white or, or it's been brightened up, it looks like it's coming towards you as well. So we're creating that, that illusion. So we have uh, lots of fun with that. And... Uh, the next one is uh, Memento Mori. Now, this is uh, gonna give us an idea of how I came up with the idea we're gonna be playing with later on today. As you can see, this is a skull and we're looking at it, uh, looking down on it. And uh, one side of the skull, most of the skin was peeled away, the left, left side, so it tended to be a little bit lighter than on the right side, especially up on the forehead, so that you can look and you can see that the roses which went around as a, like a crown around the top of this skull. I've got like a dark rose on a light ground, on a light background there above uh, the, the eye to the left. And I've got a white colored or a light colored rose on a dark background on the, head, on the eye to the right. And one of the things that uh, will uh, shorten the life of a pumpkin is if, if you keep it sealed up while the while the uh, candle's inside, it generates heat inside there. And that starts to cook the pumpkin and that starts to age the pumpkin. So 
you know, having spent so much time on this pumpkin, I wanted it to last. And it wasn't important to keep the uh, lid on this pumpkin while I was displaying it, I thought. So I take the lid off so the heat can go out and that's gonna keep the uh, top from scorching or the pumpkin from heating up too much. And look what it looked like when I took the lid off. If you look from below a little bit more, you can see into the eye sockets, you see that hole where the lid was. And because I don't have uh, that lid there, it's not shining like a sconce. It's not a, like a reflecting back wall uh, inside the pumpkin to, to direct the light out. I've got a black hole there that's, that's uh, created by having removed that lid. And I thought that that kind of spoiled the effect. It didn't look nice that way. It didn't have that haunting bright eyes that I wanted. But then I thought better of it. I said, wait a minute, maybe I can make use of that extra dimension. Maybe I can use the back wall of the pumpkin to create um, an additional effect. So let's take a look at the next pumpkin, which was done quite a few years later. I've cut holes in the back of that pumpkin. So now that they become the dark part of the eye and they sit in the socket. This one's called the King of the Dead, another skull. Um, and also along the top of the crown, you can see that I've got it crenellated up on top. Uh, so it's a, a little bit unusual in terms of the shape. It's not just, I'm cutting a, a round circle in the top of it. So there's our King of the Dead. And when I first used this technique of, of putting in eyes like this, the image of the pumpkin was a, of a wolf. So whenever I use this technique these days, I call it a wolf-eyed pumpkin. So this is a wolf-eyed King of the Dead because I'm using this technique. And if we go to the next image, you'll see a wild cat with wolf eyes or a lion, whatever. We'll call it a wolf-eyed lion. And this is what it looks like if you look straight on. If you move to the side, move one way, you'll see what it looks like. If I move to the left, look, the eyes look like they're following you. Now, if I move to the right, what happens? The eyes look like they're following you again. And it's a wonderful effect. Uh, but of course, that's uh, just changing the relative angle from this eye socket in front to the uh, eye hole in the back of the pumpkin. And we're going, I'm going to show you how you can do that today. All right. So let's see if we can go back live to the camera on me. And we'll get started real quick. Can you see me? Can you hear me? Yes, I think we're good. If oh, okay. Because I don't see anything on my screen. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this pumpkin and I'm going to carve or draw a face on it. And I've got it pretty much underway because we're kind of limited for time today. And what I'm using, I don't know if you can see this, I'm using a, uh, uh, it's not, it's a water soluble pen. Uh, what I like to do is I want to mark the pumpkin with, uh, with lines that I can then erase later on. If I were to use a ballpoint pen or a Sharpie or something, it'd be a permanent marker and it would mar the, the pumpkin. In this case, I can erase this later on. See that? So I'm going to draw this outline. Okay. Here are going to be the eyes. Here's going to be my mask. And I thought if, if I carved around the outside of this mask, it would be a dark mask. It would just be a dark shape. If you can see it's just dark. Or if I skinned it, it would look like a white mask, right? Um, and to just sort of create the effect for our demonstration purposes, if you wanted to put something like the word boo on it, or the word vote as popular these days, whatever you want to do, um, if you want to put the Rolling Stones logo on the front, you could do that too. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a checkerboard. I'm going to make a checkerboard mask today. All right, so that'll give us some, some idea of how to do this. All right. Should I move back? Can you see me now, Angela? Are we in the screen? 
Yep, you're in the screen okay. completely. Looking good. I got to get your, your feedback. Mm -hmm. All right. I do most of my, I do virtually all of my carving without opening the pumpkin. Most people will open up a pumpkin, they'll scoop, scoop it out, and they'll start carving that way. I find that the pumpkin gets less damage and I'm less likely to crush it, damage it if I, uh, if I carve with the pumpkin whole to begin with. And uh, it's kind of like if you ever took a chicken egg and put it in your hand and try to squeeze it and crush it. You can't do it. It's not, you know, it's rounded the way it is, the way it distribute, distributes the pressure. It uh, holds up. What I'm doing is I'm cutting around the outside of this. To define the edge. And let me show you the tool I'm using. Um, I use, ba use this tool, this is what, what I call my outside tool. You notice the tip of it is very, is very sharp. It's kind of like a, a craft knife or a hobby knife. It's very pointy and very sharp. But this, pump, this is the knife that I use most of the time because it can do the most things. If you get one tool that just does one thing, like a gouge that only makes circles, well, that's great if you're making lots of circles but I need to do other things. I can make circles with this if I need to. So, but this is long enough for me to get into the pumpkin to take the lid off. It's flat sided so I can skin, skin the pumpkin when I need to. It's got a delicate point so I can carve little details. So most of my work gets done with just this knife alone. And having cut around the outside of the mask, I've laid it out to look like a checkerboard. I'm just going to cut down my lines like this. All right. Now, this is going to take me a while to do this part of the mask. So if anybody has any questions right now, I can answer them while I'm focusing on this, and you can watch me carve. Because otherwise, it's like watching uh, paint dry or the grass grow. So. If anybody has a, a question that I can answer while I'm doing this, that'll be great. You notice I'm turning the pumpkin. Sometimes if I get to a point, it's easier to turn the pumpkin than it is to try to turn the knife. Sorry, okay. I don't know how to write. What I want to ask is, do you make your designs on paper? and then in, in your mind, transfer it to the pumpkin at a later time? That's a good, good question. I have a notebook. When I get bright ideas, and maybe I'll have time to show it to you later on, um, I, I put them in my notebook. So I do put them there. But of course, when you do something on, on paper, it's on a flat surface, and the pumpkin's curved. So you really have to reinterpret your design as you draw it right on the pumpkin. It uh, that way. And we have a question from Suzanne. Yeah. Uh, what is that knife that you're using? And where did you purchase it? Where did I purchase it? You know, they, I don't think they make them anymore. Oh. Um, when, I, when I first started out, I found a, the ideal knife, or the, the light knife that I used for many years in a uh, sort of a junk drawer. And uh, what was nice about it was most knives um, have what they call a belly in them. Can you imagine the front of a canoe, how it curves and then goes up to the point, the tip of the canoe? Um, this knife doesn't have a belly in it. It's, it's a straight, pretty much a straight triangle. See it? And that's what makes it neat because when it's a triangle like that, I can, I can it'll turn if the, uh, in the in the pumpkin in a very small turning circle if you don't have a if you have a belly in it you can't make the curves as much because the blade is thicker towards the tip so that's what the advantage is with with this particular knife um it's actually called a fluting knife if you were a uh, you know a chef or a you know a food preparer it's called a, a fluting knife 
but you can use a regular paring knife uh, to do do the work and use it in combination with a, uh, as I said, a craft knife. You know, if I do these initial lines, it'd be more convenient to use a craft knife. Let me see if I got one I can show you. One of these kind of guys, you know, with a with a pointed blade. Can you see that? It's a, I don't have the blade in it, but uh, you can get those in hobby shops and, and use them that way. Okay, so I've cut out my little uh, section here, and I'm gonna cut the checkerboard out. Now, once again, I'm not sure if everybody can see this too well, but what I'm doing is I'm holding the knife here and I use two hands, right? But actually the, the hand that holds the knife is not the hand that does the cutting. It's the other one that pushes the blade or I pivot against that other finger and mm. voila, it comes out. I work from the center towards the edge of whatever it is I want to remove. See how that's coming out? Yep. This may take a while. I gotta watch out here. I'm gonna... Puppy and carving is not something that one should do in haste. I mean, it's too dangerous with the sharp knives, but it spoils the fun. It's one of the most frequent questions I get asked is, how long does it take you to do this? And I guess it's hard to answer because I don't usually time myself because it's not a timed event usually. Except for today, I only have an hour to get this done or to produce something to, to show you. So that's a little bit odd for me. But I like to take the take my time and sort of let forget about time for a while. It's good when you're being uh, sequestered in, in place, you know? Good activity. We have another question from yeah. Edwin. How many times have you cut yourself? <laughs> Oh, I don't know. Never, never too seriously. But it's bound to happen if you're not careful. But accidents do careful. But I, I try to avoid this. Can you see see if I work it down here? Yep. All right. I'm going to do that there. It's a little bit easier this way because. One of the things I wanted to tell people, you know, if you spend this much time on a pumpkin, you want it to last. And if you, like so many people, carve the pumpkin and put it out on your front porch, and if you leave it out there all the time, um, it's going to only last just a couple of days. Aha, I actually sliced that one. All right, well, I can repair that. So what I was saying about the uh, preserving a pumpkin. So instead of leaving a pumpkin out, out all day long where it's going to be exposed to the sun and get dried or 
fruit flies are gonna get it or the squirrels or the deer are gonna chew it up. What I do is I only put pumpkins out at night when they're gonna be on display. And during the interim time, during the meantime, I wrap them in plastic. That keeps them from drying out. It keeps the fruit flies from getting to them. And uh, I put them on the north side of the house or in a shady spot so that they don't heat up. But what really, uh, after uh, trying to avoid all the things that eat pumpkins, everything from mold to mildew to um, fruit flies and, and on up, the real thing that ages a pumpkin is the loss of moisture. If you've ever had uh, celery that's gone rubbery and floppy and it's not crisp anymore, uh, maybe you know the trick of taking it and putting it in a glass of water and letting it sit for a little bit and the stalk of celery will reabsorb the water and become uh, nice and crisp again. Uh, and uh, the pumpkin does the same thing. They start looking kind of leathery and sad after just uh, a short period of time. And if you take your pumpkin and soak it, it will reabsorb that water and get nice and tight like a drum again, which is really nice. And that, uh, you do that every, every uh, two or three days and it will help that pumpkin to last longer. But they all end up on the compost heap eventually. So if you wanted to carve a pumpkin for Halloween, what time would you think would be the best time to start carving one? Um, well, I've had, you know, it depends on genetics too, just like for anything oh. else. You know, you grow a pumpkin, but I've had a pumpkin last almost a month. I've had a pumpkin oh, wow. that last a month. You know, and most of the time people, you know, if they just leave them out, you know, they last maybe four, five days at the outside, you know, before they really become kind of unpresentable, or lose a lot of their character. So. Do you have a favorite type of pumpkin to carve on? A favorite kind of pumpkin? Well, you know, the, these classic pumpkins are called uh, uh, Kentucky Field pumpkins or Connecticut pumpkins. They're a uh, cucurbitae pipo is the variety. You know, this, th these are the classic jack-o'-lantern pumpkins. I've used many different kinds of pumpkins in the past. I've even tried like Hubbard squash and stuff like that just for fun. Uh, but what I, uh, if I have a favorite pumpkin, it's, it's not so much the variety of pumpkin, because most of the time we're carving these cla classic kinds of uh, winter squash, the, one, the ones we call pumpkins. And uh, what I like to do is I like to look for pumpkins that are unusual shapes. Let me give you an example. This one's, this is like the typical pumpkin. It's like, the, I call it a Charlie Brown pumpkin. It's kind of like a basketball with a stem on it. And you know, that's the one that gets pictured as sort of the, uh, the icon of Halloween or of the fall. Everybody sees this kind of a pumpkin. But what I like to look for are pumpkins with odd shapes because that adds another dimension. And I may have a particular pumpkin in mind, so I'm looking for um, something special. Let's say I'm doing the man in the moon, right? Obviously I want a round pumpkin. Um, I probably want one that doesn't have heavy corrugations in it. So it's smooth enough so I can put details or carve it and, and it's not gonna be um, distorted by those undulations in the surface. So sometimes you go out looking for a particular pumpkin because you have a particular design in mind. So you're looking for the pumpkin but sometimes the pumpkin is looking back at you and suggests something. I mean, look at this pumpkin. Can you see it? See that pucker that goes all the way around? 
this is the kind of pumpkin they, they throw on the compost heap and they say, who, wa who wants this pumpkin? But I think this pumpkin looks like, like some, somebody who's got a, a pucker, like a mouth or something. It almost suggests, can you see it? Yes, we can. I, I don't know. I mean, you, I'm sure everybody sees something different, right? Because it's no longer just your average round pumpkin. It's got a character all its own, <laughs> right? And you, we can make this into something, you know, whether it's this way and it looks like maybe they're wearing a, uh, a tam or some sort of a beret up on top, which separates it. Maybe it's, you know, an old man with a, a kind of a toothless uh, pucker to the face. I don't know, but it, it, it has potential. It stimulates your imagination, right? So I like looking for pumpkins that look different. All right, so I've got this carved somewhere there. There's the chip. I accidentally slipped and cut this one. So if that happens sometimes. I've got this mask. I've skinned it around. I think what I'm going to do at this point, though, is show you another thing to do. Sometimes you'll have a pumpkin. And it doesn't sit flat. Right? You put the pumpkin up and it sits on an angle and you don't want it on that angle. And in this case, what I'm going to do is I'm going to be cutting these pumpkins from the bottom. So there'll be like a basket that goes over the candle. And what I'm doing here is I've got this on a, a bowl at this point. If the pumpkin normally sat on, on, the, on the surface and it was on an angle and I didn't like that or I wanted to change the angle, I can set the pumpkin up just the way I want it. And then I take my pen and I mark it right where the bowl is like this. And that's the way I'm going to be able to cut it on the bottom. And when it's set, it'll sit at the right angle I want it. Everybody see that? So that's going to help me there. In this case, maybe I'll, I'll sit this here. Set it on this bowl. You got to get the right size bowl. And I'm going to mark this pumpkin. And we're going to go for the insides now. In this case. I've got it marked for where I'm going to cut it. How are we doing for time, Angela? Let me see. We are at 2.41. 2.41, I got 15 minutes? Yep, just about. All right. All right, I'm pulling this out. This is the fun part. Now I get to use my inside tool. As I said, I had an outside tool and an inside tool. My inside tool is an old gravy ladle with the handle bent. So what I'm doing here with this, I can put wrap that bent handle around my little pinky and it won't slip out of my hand when it gets overwhelmed with slime. The seed. Another reason to do all your carving on the outside and start to thin out the walls of the pumpkin before you 
cut out a mouth or eyes or anything like that is the walls of the pumpkin are, are pretty thick. But by scraping it down like I am removing the, the guts of the pumpkin and thinning the walls of the pumpkin, it's going to be a lot easier to take those, open up those eye sockets or the mouth or whatever I want to cut through. I'm not cutting through such a large or such a thick, thick wall of a pumpkin. So it's going to be greatly improved. Okay. Lucky me, I've got a finished pumpkin to show you. So this is just to give you the roughest of ideas because I certainly uh, like to take my time. Now I'm gonna cut this almond shaped eye out. But to do that, I'm gonna first cut out a space in the center. I don't cut right to that finish line area first. because this gives me more maneuverability and it relieves the pressure on the area I'll be cutting in. Voila. All right, and now I can bevel the angles on here so that, that I don't have any of the wall of the pumpkin impeding or blocking that, that opening. I'm cutting back on an angle. All right, rough and ready, but here we go. All right, I've got to cut through. Now I'm going to show you how to, to make the wolf eyes. In order to do this, I need a, uh, I use a barbecue skewer or a stick. In this case, I'm going to use a uh, knitting needle. And what I do is I look into the eyes of the pumpkin, right? And I want to go straight back into that eye, right in the middle, so that I find the part of the back wall that's right in line with the center of the eye. As I look in, I've got the back wall, it's the center of the eye, and I push the sewing needle through, or the knitting needle through. See how it comes out the back? That's going to tell me where I can carve in the back, so it'll be lined up where it should be. Okay, so once I've got that marked up, where that is, I do a circle around it, 
That's what's going to get cut out and be the, the I on both of them. I moved the computer, so I hope this is a, at an angle where people can see what I'm doing. Yes, we can see you. Okay, great. Now, you notice that this is just like a, a tube. You want to cut away from this so you don't have any of the wall blocking that circular hole that you've got in the back for the eye. I'm cutting it at an angle, like I said, a, a bevel. Right. So now I can look in and I see that I've got to carve some of the wall away because it blocks that round opening. All right. Let's see if you can see this at all. You can fine tune it, but you can see that there are. You can see the holes in there. We see your play on the shirt, though. <laughs> it's hard to see, but if they would be <laughs> black in the, in the dark, the and you can see if I turn the head, that go. hole moves. Now, maybe those eyes ought to be a little bit bigger, I think. But we can adjust that. But. This pumpkin was just for the purpose of showing you that technique. All right. Um, once again, you can create flat uh, skinned areas in order to make lines. I do what, what's called a, a V cut. I'll make a cut with, with my knife and then I go back and I angle on the other side and cut it out. The reason I call it a V cut because now I've got a line of sorts there. But if you look at that sliver that I took out in cross section, it's a V, see it? And that's how you make lines. So flat surfaces, lines, cutting through. I know we're running out of time, so I, I carved another pumpkin. And what I'm going to do is we're gonna surprise each other this way. We're gonna get underneath, I think, the tent together to see this pumpkin. All right, that sounds exciting. You know, <laughs> we shall see, won't we? I've got it here. I'm going to put a light on it, on inside it. I yeah. think, uh, one moment. Maybe I can find a better way to prop this up so you can see it. You can see I've never done one of these videos before. Oh, that's not bad. That actually works great. That ought to work. You're like that's the sign around the camera now. Hey, I actually planned this a bit. Um, I'm going to put it on a lazy Susan so we can see what happens then. Of course, this design is a little bit different than the one we were just working on, but all the same principle. Now here's the exciting and intimate part, you know? Here we are, separated from our friends and family and everything these days. And you know, you do these Zoom broadcasts and it's the best we can do to get together. Now, how intimate is this? I'm gonna have you uh, all get under the uh, blanket with me. It's daytime, so I don't, 
Wasn't sure if this is gonna work. Does that make sense? All right, that's, that's looking, oh, there we go. That helped? I did. Let's see what happens when we turn on the light. Ah. The cover went over it, so we have a dramatic reveal. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna have a reveal here, but I gotta get the, uh, the light working. Ah, there it is. Can you see? There we go. If you tilt it a little, there we go. Now we can see the eyes. Yeah. Um, in this case, I have a white mask. And what I did was I cut in deeper where the the nose of the traditional jack-o'-lantern would be and where the mouth would be. I don't know if it's dark enough to see the subtlety there, but you can see the mouth flowing through the white mask. And then I put these lines in which indicate the wrinkles on the mask and they go over the mask or over the mouth and over the nose. Uh, this would be much better in the dark, but it creates that idea of, of layers that I was talking about. You can see the face that's coming through this translucent mask, but then you see the wrinkles that are on the surface of the mask. And of course, if you move side to side, it's watching you. So there's my COVID-19 jack-o'-lantern for 2020. That is such a good effect with the eyes. I really do like it with the traditional- Yeah, it's called the wolf-eyed pumpkin, right? Whatever. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I guess that's a bit. I'm out of time. Well, we still have five minutes for any final questions. If anybody wants to unmute themselves, if you have any comments, please do so. We'll be happy to hear from you. I am fascinated by what this gentleman has done today. And uh, I am particularly impressed because I was a math teacher with the cubed pumpkin. And right. I just want to make the comment about that, that that just so impressed me because it almost reminded me of an Escher picture. Oh, and yeah. And had that three dimensional, uh, you know, work in there. Well, you know, that's all very mathematical. I'm glad we got a math teacher. I was never particularly good in math, but I loved art. But uh, so I, I came in the back door when it comes to any sort of um, mathematical sensitivities. And yes, you know, he used tessellations. Um, we can think of t the tessellations of, of regular uh, geometric forms, like a checkerboard is a tessellation of, of squares. And of course, a, a beehive or a honeycomb is a tessellation of hexagons. But what was unique with Escher, and he was inspired by the abstract uh, tessellations he found in the uh, tile work at the Alhambra in Spain. But uh, that's what inspired him. But what made Escher unique was he transformed those tessellations into uh, uh, images of, of things like interlocking bats or butterflies or fish and, and birds and things like that. So he changed those geometric patterns into what we would interpret as uh, illustrative imagery. So that's kind of a neat thing. But the tessellation's a, a fun thing, right? Any other questions? Uh, I had a question, and actually I'm um, outside in the, in the nice day because I had you on my cell phone, and it's, it's very easy to watch. Oh, great. Um, what, what was the instrument, the, the white pen that you used in the to, to mark your pumpkin? Um, well, you know, they sometimes call milky pens. Oh, okay. They call gel pens. I, I like them because the tip is soft. If I were to use a ballpoint pen, not only would it more likely than not leave behind the ink, but it would also create a crease or a pressure point in the skin, which is gonna be detectable in the light. So I wanna do something that doesn't mar the surface of the, uh, of the pumpkin at all and that'll wash off. And I get my little spray bottle and I spray it later on and with a, maybe a, a green kind of scrubby pad or a little bit of soap and water, it'll come off and 
leave no trace. But even, even if I have a little bit of residue left over, um, it doesn't show up when the pumpkin's illuminated if I'm using a white milky pen. All right. This was awesome. Thank you, Thomas. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear the question. No question. I said this was awesome. Thank you. Oh, good, good. I'm glad you like it. I ha I will say I agree. Also, this has been the best. Um, you know, you can look. I learned so many techniques. Good. You can look uh look me up online if you look up my name, Tomas Gonzalez Pumpkins. There's a uh, a website that was created by a friend of mine who unfortunately passed away a number of years ago, but he collected uh, quite a few different images of pumpkins I've done in the past. Well, I hope you have fun and I hope you give it a shot. If you do a uh, masked pumpkin, you can send it to the uh, Catherine Dixon Hoffman uh, people. You can send it to Angela and maybe we can post them as a follow-up to see uh, what kind of inspired uh, creations uh, Yes, we'll have, we'll have a Facebook post with more details on that. Great. Whatever you guys create with this, we would love to have, we would love to see what you do. I should do it this way. Yes. <laughs> All right. Well, there are no other questions. Again, thank you so much, Tomas. This was fantastic. You're welcome. Thank you. I really appreciate people coming to find out. My uh, whole objective here, ever since uh, I was doing this for the, the kids when they were little, is to delight and to inspire. So I, I hope I've got a little piece of, of each of those today. Well, I think so. Good. Okay.